Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you to the 29th lecture on the course Management Organizational Policies and Practices. Let's have a recap at uh, lecture 28 and then we move to uh, the contents of today's lecture. Uh, during the previous lecture, we had a discussion on uh, the formation of teams, uh, the reasons why teams are formulated, when they should be formulated, how team structures can be uh, 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 can give better outcomes compared to the individualized uh, work designs under what circumstances um, can we benefit from the team structures and under what circumstances the individual structures they can be uh, they might be uh, better for the firm so that kind of decisions the, the managers that uh, need to make we um, had a discussion on uh, that then we discussed that how and what are the different reasons that the, uh, the popularity of teams is growing in the organizations but are teams really an answer to all the problems of the firms or not uh, we also made a, a, a comparison and a contrast between the uh, groups and teams wherein we tried to make an understanding we tried to develop an understanding of how these two concepts are uh, not interchangeable and how they are distinct concepts and uh, we discussed uh, on a number of areas such as the synergies that are uh, that, that positive synergies they are generated in teams but not in the groups and how the individuals in the teams they are uh, they, they, their, their skills they are interrelated and complementary but in the groups their skill the skills of the group members they might be varied and they might be random uh, because the goals in the team uh, they are uh, the combined goals the mutual goals of the team members but in the groups their goals can be uh, they, 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 they set their individual goals although they uh, share the information with each other but they uh, are individually responsible for their goals right in, uh, therefore, in the groups, accountability is individual, whereas in the teams, accountability is individual as well as mutual. So, there were a number of differences that we discussed with the reference to the concept of groups and teams. Then we had a discussion where, uh, wherein we compared and contrasted the different types of teams. Right? We discussed the problem-solving teams, we discussed the self-managing teams, and we discussed the cross-functional teams, um, we discussed the virtual teams, right? and um, the, when all these different types of teams are created what are their different um, uh, characteristics of these different types of teams and what are the consequences of these different types of teams and when they are used so then we also um, identified the characteristics of effective teams overall that uh, when uh, you feel or when an organization determines that it should design its work processes or it's, it should design the jobs around teams, uh, it identifies it on the basis of the de high degree of interdependence between the, uh, between the tasks and the complex nature of the tasks and uh, which involve a number of people and which involve uh, an, uh, a number of problem solving um, uh, skills from the different varied individuals. They're on the basis of these characteristics you decide that you need to um, have teams in your organization then uh, what makes a team effective we developed uh, we um, discussed a number of characteristics that make the teams effective and that are that are the individual level that that, that are uh, about the structure the processes in the organization the composition of the team uh, the number the size of the team the uh, the roles uh, and the skills of the team members the skills of the team leader um, right the personality traits of the team member um, uh, so the, the these were a number of factors that uh, that determine the effectiveness of the teams and uh, then we discussed that how the organizations that can create the team players we discussed a number of factors such as the individual factors how the organization can in, in uh, the influence and overcome the individual uh, factors to f for the individuals to convert them into team players the individuals who are very individualistic uh, how it can convert them into team players and there are certain cultural differences uh, wherein some cultures they might be more supportive for teams such and some other cultures such as the individualistic cultures they are may not be that supportive for teams so how can the teamwork be created in uh, that kind of cultures and then we also discuss the importance of communication that how communication is important uh, in the organization um, uh, to for the teams to be effective right uh, then we discussed that uh, 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 when to use the uh, individuals instead of the teams 
and uh, then he uh, also developed an understanding of the teams uh, in different global contexts right uh, how um, the teams they are more uh, uh, for example uh, they are more effective in uh, certain cultures and how they are not effective in certain other cultures such as the risk taking cultures or the uh, cultures who are really people oriented vis a vis the task oriented cultures there can be differences uh, and then there are high power distant societies they they uh, they're in the uh, um, or the uh, societies where there is a lot of uh, uh, when there is risk when there is ambiguity right and uh, then in that kind of situations they might they might be more promising for the teams uh, than for the individuals and uh, um, what are the consequences of all these different global contexts for the formation of teams you need to have a good insight into the implications of all these uh, different factors and their influences which they so they kind of play in a moderating role in the uh, influences of the teams on the uh, performance of the work group or the work team or and, and overall organizational performance so these factors can also be treated as the moderators and you need to have an understanding that how these different cultural individual personality organizational factors they influence the effectiveness of the teams and how they influence the performance of the uh, teams and we also had a discussion that how the teams for the effectiveness of the teams if we need to relate the uh, the and the job design uh, as well as the performance evaluation systems as well as the selection and the training systems of the organizations in a way that uh, they are sub supportive of the this team uh, uh, teamwork right and the, your performance evaluation systems should be tied to the teamwork and your selection procedures should be should be such that you hire the team players you should have the processes that are in place that can have with, with the help of which you can hire the team players and we also had a discussion on how the team norms they influence the in the team members behaviors they sanction the certain kinds of behaviors and non sanction uh, certain kinds of behaviors uh, right and um, how the, uh, the, uh, the these team norms they uh, regulate the individuals uh, behavior right and um, so these were this this was all the discussion that we did during the uh, lecture 28 which was on teams today we are going to discuss in continuation with that in a broader framework we'll be discussing the foundations of organizational structure so what are the different forms of organizational structure and how those forms are different uh, we'll be discussing today what is structure first we'll uh, be understanding that what do we mean by organizational structure then we'll be seeing that how the structure is should match with the strategy of the organization what if it does not match with the strategy of the organization what are the different consequences in that case and then we'll be seeing the different forms of organizational structure and uh, the main forms of organizational structure that we'll be discussing today is the functional uh, structure the divisional structure the SBU structure and the metric structure and then we'll uh, uh, we'll be having a discussion and the implications of all these different forms of structures there the different characteristics of all these uh, uh, different structures on the basis of which the, they are distinguished when a firm can use which type of structure right what are the guidelines to uh, make or to formulate an organizational structure right and um, is it related to the firm size or is it related to the type of the firm or is it uh, related to the strategy of the firm right or is uh, is it related to the sector of the firm etc so how the structure of the organization is determined we'll be discussing all these factors and then uh, at the end we'll be <coughs> seeing the implications of all these this discussion on uh, structure for the managers and for the organizations and we'll be drawing our conclusions okay so uh, to begin with we need to have an understanding of what we really mean by organizational structure uh, uh, what does organizational structure stand for so organizational structure means that how job tasks they are formally divided grouped and coordinated right it's it is as simple as that so that um, how the different jobs that have been performed in the organization how the, what is the division of those tasks right how they are grouped and how they are coordinated right so the key elements of an organizational structure are the work specialization departmentalization chain of command span of control centralization and decentralization and formalization so these are the different elements that when we categorize them that form that they, they formulate one type of structure or they formulate another type of structure or still another type of structure right so uh, but when we are talking about organizational structure we are talking about these eight different uh, these key different elements right they form they basically combine together and they form the organizational structure so let's have a detailed look at all these different key elements of the organizational structure uh, I have here 
consider uh, 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 an interesting uh, qu uh, form form for you, uh, or a, an interesting table for you, where on the left side of the uh, of the uh, of the table or in the left column you see that there are a number of key questions and there are uh, certain answers that are uh, provided um, right and uh, for so if we look at the question number one uh, the, these are basically key design questions and answers for designing the proper organization structure so the first question is to what degree are articles subdivided into separate jobs so these questions and these are the answers provided they will basically help you they are the questions are basically a definition of the uh, different elements of the organizational structures so work specialization how do you determine the work specialization um, if you look at the right hand side uh, of the of the of the table uh, work specialization is basically uh, it, it will be answered by the degree to uh, the uh, uh, by the the degree to which the articles they have been subdivided into separate jobs right so if an organization is for example producing uh, uh, for example, if an organization is producing uh, some uh, uh, office furniture, right, and it's, it is uh, it is producing office chairs and office table, uh, let's take an example: an office chair and uh, office chair and an office table, right? And if it divides these uh, this task of producing the office table, right, if it divides it in such a way that uh, uh, the the four legs they will be produced by one person and the top will be produced by uh, another person so it divides the task on the basis of the uh, legs and the top of the table right so um, uh, it so what it has the organization has done is that it has uh, specialized the, uh, the specialized the job and it has defined them in terms of the production of the legs and the production of the uh, top so this is the work specialization right so uh, one person is doing one individual one specialized task of making only legs and the other person is doing another specialized task of uh, task of making only the top of the table right so if that one same person has to produce the whole table so it means that he has to produce the legs as well as the top of the table the concept behind work specialization is that if you uh, if uh, the individuals they should be trained in such a way that they should have the specialized skills to produce a particular task so there uh, there should be task specialization there should be work specialization each in, in each individual should be my producing one specific uh, should be doing one specific work and keep on doing it repeatedly so when that individual keeps on doing it repeatedly he specialized to do that task right and he does that with more efficiency with greater detail more efficiency more accuracy and in less lesser time right and with the lower costs and lesser time right and um, the time that uh, an individual will take if it has to produce both the parts of the table that is the top and the legs uh, then uh, the time that uh, that individual would take in producing the both the parts that would be um, uh, uh, for if he is produce the legs and then he also has to produce the top then he'll be changing his equipment that is using the hammers or the other equipment that he might be using uh, he he might need to change his equipment he might need to change his place he might, might need to bring some other raw material for producing the top and then uh, the time would be wasted but if he has to keep on producing only legs and legs and legs of the tables then he will be using the same equipment sitting in the same place and keep on doing the task repeatedly and thus he, he will be lose, uh, saving on time and uh, he, he will be specialized in doing that activity and um, as a result gaining more and more experience and as a result his uh, specialization will improve and the efficiency will come in the work and the cost will also be lower and and the uh, more and more production and output will be achieved at lower lowest possible time so this is basically the concept of uh, work specialization right that um, you divide uh, the different articles or the different production or different units uh, on the basis to separate in separate jobs right that is work specialization now what is departmentalization departmentalization is that you departmentalize uh, how do you group the different uh, jobs into uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 into one department right that is departmentalization for example um, uh, the, the, the w f for example this if you if you group uh, combine these uh, uh, group these uh, these jobs of producing the legs and table into one right and uh, you name it as the uh, table production unit right so that is one department where, wherein the tables are being produced and therein two separate jobs are being done right so uh, that is you have you have combined those two separate jobs 
but they are linked job and you have combined them into one and you have made a separate department for that right and uh, so that is departmentalization that on what basis the jobs are grouped together then the chain of command that to whom do individuals and groups report right and what would be the reporting relationships that is what is defined here uh, who, who will be the uh, who, who to whom will be the shop floor worker reporting first line manager for first line supervisor or the direct supervisor for example and then to whom the so, uh, direct supervisor will be reporting will it be the regional manager will it be the area manager or um, will it be the um, operations manager or whoever whatever whatever is the hierarchy in the organization on the basis of that how the chain of command will be working in that organization that is who will report to whom right and then the span of control span of control is basically the uh, uh, that that how many individuals can a manager effectively and efficiently direct right so how many individuals they are reportable to one manager right so if at the functional unit level or as a functional manager how many employees they are reportable to one functional manager or uh, in a department uh, what are the level of managers you might uh, be having uh, team leaders and then you also might be having supervisors and uh, as another layer right or you might remove the layer of the team leaders and you might have only the managers right and uh, uh, so there can be different uh, it depends upon again the structure of the organization that what structure it is following so the span of control also determines the structure of the organization whether it is um, uh, a narrow span of control or it is a uh, wider span of control so we'll be discussing this in our next slide then the centralization and decentralization are basically where does decision making authority lies right and uh, 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 under in the centralization it lies of course at the center and decentralization the decision making is uh, spread it's not only at the top management so we'll be discussing this also in our next slide and the formalization is to what degree will there be rules and regulations to direct employee and manager so how formalized is your workplace how formalized are the certain ways of uh, doing things the processes and the policies and the rules and regulations how much they are in place how strict they are how many they are right so uh, in certain organizations there are rules for everything right for every minute thing there are rules there are policies right and in certain organizations there are not so many rules right so that is the formalization how, the degree to which the organization is formalized then um, work specialization as we discussed earlier it is the degree to which task in the organization they are subdivided into separate jobs so here there is basically the concept of the division of labor it makes efficient use of employee skills right uh, because the employee who is skillful for one specific kind of task has to do only that task nothing else right so it increases employee skills through repetition and of course the skills are uh, enhanced the skills are improved when you are doing the same activity again and again the skills are improved right then uh, less between uh, between job downtime increases productivity as i discussed earlier that when you have to switch uh, from uh, from doing one activity to another activity and um, the time is lost and that is saved by way of work specialization and the specialized training is more efficient right if you uh, train the individuals on specialization then it uh, further increases their efficiency and it allows use of specialized equipment right uh, okay, so if we see here that economies of this economies of scale, how they are related to uh, work specialization. So at the horizontal axis, we see that there is work specialization and at the vertical, there is productivity. And we see that up to a certain point with the increases in the work specialization, the productivity increases, but beyond that point, it is about on decline, right? Uh, so very at very high levels of spe work specialization, the productivity, it starts to fall, right? Mm, because the work becomes too much repetitive and it becomes too much autonomous for the employee and as a result the productivity of the employee starts falling because it does not enjoy doing that work anymore and it reduces the employee morale and as a result the employee productivity also falls right we'll discuss further on this when we discuss the different forms of structure now we come to the departmentalization which is the basis by which jobs are grouped together so as we discussed earlier that how the jobs are grouped together on the basis on which so sometimes the jobs are grouped together the functions uh, uh, by, by the functions that they perform for example the human resource de uh, department the audit department the accounting department like the operations department etc so there are the different functions that are being performed in the organizations and those are all the related functions they are grouped together into one department so all the human resource related activities the different jobs that the human resource for example is the, there is the uh, recruitment manager there is compensation 
competition manager who is doing the competition activities and there is the training manager there is the selection manager etc but they are all in the uh, common uh, the the the, uh, the they are all grouped into the one department which is the human resource department right and uh, similarly the op all the operations and all that activities they are being done in the operations department all the activities which are related to the productivity and the production etc right and all the audit activities in the audit department so you have grouped them on the basis of the functions right and then they can also be uh, grouped on the basis of the products right so what kind of products are you dealing in whether you're dealing in the consumer products or you're dealing in commercial products right uh, so you can also uh, uh, group them on the basis of those products so uh, when we'll be discussing in future in the uh, div divisional structure we'll be seeing that how uh, the certain organizations they use the, uh, the, the, the this divisional structure by product right and some organizations use the structure by uh, geography in the basis of the geographic regions you make your uh, uh, you, you you department lies on the basis of the uh, geographic locations of your units right so for example you say that the uh, Asia Pacific uh, region uh, the, this is the, uh, the, the uh, end or, or the Middle East region or the um, or the American region right so certain countries such as the coca-cola they make their divisions on such basis uh, right and then we have the process that uh, you also make distinction on the department lies on the basis of the processes so the similar processes they are departmentalized into one uh, and the other, other processes are departmentalized into another which are similar in nature right then on the basis of the customers also right uh, so uh, such as the consumer di division or the corporate division they are again the uh, by consumer departmentalization okay um, then uh, we have this um, authority authority is the as we all know it is the rights inherent in a managerial position to give orders and to expect the orders to be obeyed right so um, chain of command we discussed that it's the unbroken line of authority that extends from the top of the organization to the lowest uh, in and clarifies who reports to whom right so chain of command it is the unbroken line of authority right so uh, reporting relationships has been discussed earlier then we have the unity of command which is the a subordinate should have only one superior to whom he or she is directly responsible that is the unity of command principle it states that at one time and a subordinate has to be answerable or it has to be uh, the subordinate has to be reportable to only one boss he cannot have more than one bosses right that is the unity of command principle and we'll be discussing more about it when we discuss the different forms of organizational structure span of control has been discussed is the number of subordinates a manager can efficiently and effectively direct so the concept of span of control is that the wider spans of management they increase organizational efficiency how do they increase organizational efficiency because uh, when we mean what do we mean that the wider spans of control we mean that there are fewer layers of managers and there are more people who are reporting to the same managers right and um, as a result the uh, with the costs are reduced because the layer in the management at least one layer maybe in the management that reduces right and as a result so it depends upon how wide the span of control is if it is very wide then maybe multiple layers of management are they are they are uh, they are in eliminated and as a result it reduces the cost and increases the efficiency um, right and a narrow span span there has certain drawbacks on the other hand because uh, it there are additional layers of management which can be avoided and that are expensive so that is the drawback of the narrow span of control and then the increased complexity of vertical communication is there when you have multiple layers of uh, uh, multiple layers of the management and uh, of course then the chain of command is from the lower level manager to the senior manager and uh, that senior manager to his boss and that boss to his boss and so on right so the chain of command will be like that and there will be multiple layers in the hierarchy and as a result uh, your uh, com uh, communication vertical communication will become very complex and it, uh, uh, the uh, the decision making can also be slow as a result of this then encouragement of overly uh, tight supervision and discouragement of employee autonomy right because um, uh, because uh, this ki this kinds of uh, uh, structures that employ this narrow span of control they are really uh, they're kind of the bureaucratic structures wherein um, uh, employees uh, they don't have much power they don't have much autonomy for the decision making is at the top and the decisions they have to flow down from the top management to the lower level employees and as a result one the decision making is slow to the employee autonomy and uh, morale is also low 
So herein we see this uh, um, that uh, we have the, the graphic presentation of this narrow and the wide span of control. Uh, on the left hand side um, uh, triangle you can see the n uh, narrow span of control where we have assumed that there is span of 4. So we have a number of uh, layers of uh, men. <coughs> manager so their managers level is from one to six so one is the top level manage, manage manager and uh, the six is the bottom level manager so each manager at all levels is uh, uh, the, uh, it is uh, looking for four employees so the f at the top level the first level um, at the uh, if you if you look at the tip of this uh, triangle at one you see that there is the top management manager right and he is uh, four people are responsible to that manager right and uh, then uh, to, uh, to those four managers there are two there might be four area managers right, right? and they are again looking for four people each so th there are 16 people below them and then those 16 are again looking for four each there is then 64 below them those 64 again looking for each and it makes 256 and this is how it is there are um, multiple layers you need to have six to seven employees so that all the employees they are reporting to their uh, uh, to some of their managers at their the level next to them right and in the who are next to them in the hierarchy uh, but if if you widen the span of control, if you make it 8 instead of 4, then you can see that you have only managers from level 1 to 4, right? So you have, uh, you have directly eliminated the two levels of management by uh, widening the span of control from 4 to 8, right? So now again, the 4,096 employees, they are, uh, 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 they are reportable uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, to, their, to their higher level and they are again reportable to their higher level but only all the employees they are covered only in the four layers of management and in the when the span of control is narrow then all the employees are covered in six layers of management right so here in widening the span of control only by you have and eliminating the two uh, management hierarchies you are considerably reducing the um, uh, you are considerably reducing the costs right and um, it's not only about the cost that the firm is reducing but also the efficiency and the, the speed with which the decision making decision making can be done that improves it gives more flexibility to the employees it, it, it gives more autonomy to the employees at the lower level basically when the managers they are uh, widening the span of control and then they give also more authority and the more autonomy to the employees to take certain decisions with themselves right because then it's not possible that for every employee for everything he's coming so many number of employees that coming to one manager and uh, they are waiting for the manager to make decisions on every uh, aspect right so the, it also gives a certain degree of autonomy to the uh, to the employees then um, the centralization it is basically the degree to which the decision making is centralized at one single point in time a uh, point in the organization right and uh, the decentralization is the degree to which decision making is spread throughout the organization right so in centralization of course the decision making decisions are made at the top and they then they flow to the uh, bottom while in decentralization the decisions uh, are the, the at the lower level uh, also the decisions take place or that the lower level employees also participate in the decision making process or they have the autonomy and the authority to uh, the, they have the autonomy uh, that they can make some decisions themselves so that is decentralization and the formalization is the degree to which the uh, jobs within the organization are uh, standardized right so uh, uh, as we discussed earlier that the, the the rules and regulations how much rules and regulations are formed and um, how much uh, strict the companies on the rules and regulations that is the formalization Okay, there are a uh, number of different types of organization structures. Let's uh, start with this simple structure which is characterized by lower degree of departmentalization, wide spans of control, authority centralized in a single person and little formalization. So that is basically an example where uh, uh, of an owner manager, right, or um, a proprietor you can say who is, uh, who is basically the sole owner of, the, of a business right and um, here uh, th this is the example of the jack gold um, uh, uh, owner manager uh, which is a men's store right so here what we can see is that at the top there is only this owner manager jack gold himself right and he has a number of uh, um, 
uh, he has a number of uh, people who are reporting to him so the span of control is really wide you can say that, that this is the only manager at the higher level and all these people they are reporting to this manager there are a few sales uh, persons and there is one cashier and he is the owner manager of a retail store right so the very simple structure there is very wide span of control authority is uh, of course centralized here in that single person and there is little formalization right so um, the, the, it is not a costly structure it is a very simple structure it is easily understandable structure it is um, uh, um, less bureaucratic as well right and authority of course lies in the uh, in that uh, single person right then the bu what is bureaucracy it is a, a structure of highly operating routine tasks achieved through specialization very formalized rules and regulations tasks that are grouped into functional departments uh, centralized authority narrow spans of control and decision making that follows the chain of command right so here in uh, the uh, there is uh, the tasks are very routine and how they are made routine through have heavy reliance on specialization so there is the concept of work specialization works are highly specialized as a result the tasks are really routinized right and uh, there are very, very much formal ways of doing things there are f from formal rules and regulations in the organization which are strictly followed right and uh, the tasks uh, are uh, grouped into these functional departments there is departmentalization on the basis of the functions right and uh, the authority is centralized right it's so the individuals they don't have any authority there is there are highly centralized organizations no decentralization no autonomy no authority with the employees at the lower level and they have to um, uh, they, they have to do their work as per the um, um, as per the uh, uh, formal processes of the organization as per the rules and regulations they cannot deviate from them they have to strictly follow them right so and then, then there are the narrow spans of controls and as a result of narrow sp spans of controls there is a very tight control over the employees basically right uh, because there are only for example just as in the previous example we saw that there are very few employees who are reportable to one manager so one manager has to have a look only on a uh, two or three or four employees for example right and then uh, compared to that if a manager has to look for 10 to 12 employees then of course the control mechanism uh, in the later case will not be that strong and the employees will be given more uh, autonomy but they will be accountable they will be more accountable relatively right and the rules and processes they won't be that uh, hard and they won't be that formalized but here in this case then uh, there is the span of control is narrow so you see that all these act these uh, these features of the bureaucratic organizations they are basically supporting each other they're all in line with each other right there are uh, rules and regulations are very much formalized right and um, in order to keep a check and control on the, those rules and regulations and how they are being followed and um, they, the, uh, there is narrow span of control right and the decision making that uh, follows from that chain of command uh, right and um, um, in such a way that the decisions are taking taking place with the authority and their decisions are centralized and they are taking place at the higher level so all these features they are basically supporting uh, each other of the uh, in in the uh, in this system or in the bureaucracy right so what are the strengths of bureaucracy F uh, one of course um, when the, there is specialization as we discussed right in the bureauc bureaucracy um, what happens is that the of course you can reap economies of scale when uh, of the individuals they are producing the specialized tasks routinely and uh, repeatedly they are producing the same task as, as a result their per unit cost reduces and the per unit production or the output increases the productivity increases right and as a result the economies of scale they can be reaped right and also there is minimum duplication of personnel and equipment when when this uh, uh, because it is uh, as we discussed that it is a uh, uh, department lies on the basis of the function so human all the activities related to human resources they are being done in the human resource de department all the activities related to the production and operations they are being done in the operations department and as a result the uh, there is no du duplication of personnel and equipment all the people who are the technical uh, experts or, or, or who are involved in the production they are all working in that operations department utilizing those same equipment and same resources and as a result there is no duplication of resources right and um, and, and there is no duplication 
communication of equipment then there is enhanced communication between the uh, between the people who are producing this doing the similar tasks right so all the uh, in the in the in the um, uh, operations department all the people who are related to the operations or the production they will be there right so they can share they can communicate with each other they can share each other's problems and they can uh, have discussions on how to solve different uh, problems or how to fix different problems etc right they can benefit from each other's expertise uh, but here uh, we see that there is centralized decision making that is also uh, one of the um, uh, one of the features of this uh, bureaucratic organizations um, right but the weaknesses are that there is subunit conflicts with organizational goals because we saw that how the different de there is departmentalization on the basis uh, on the basis of the, uh, how the jobs are being grouped right so there can be the conflict can arise between the different units or between the different groups within the organization right um, and uh, because of the allocation of the resources for example right that one department might be wanting more allocation of resources than the other one right and or there might be some conflict between the different departments for example there is R&D department and there is the this manufacturing department right and um, R&D de department wants to focus more on the uh, production uh, production side while the manufacturing department wants to really keep on producing the existing products and reaping the economies of scale so there a conflict can arise between the two departments and also the interdepartmental communication in this kind of structures is really low right and as a result of that low in uh, interdepartment uh, communication the um, uh, and uh, also the, uh, the the conflict can arise and also because of the uh, resources uh, resource allocations that which uh, which department or uh, which uh, um, unit it gains more uh, resources it gets more resource allocations then these are can be the different points of conflicts that can arise then the obsessive concern with rules and regulations as I explained to you that there are a number of rules and regulations very minute rules uh, rules and regulations as well they, that are in place and um, uh, the, uh, the, the excessive concern is shown they are very formalized and then visuals they cannot deviate from them so that is one of the weaknesses because it's not a flexible system then right and the employees there it's not possible very it is a closed system and there is no room for any um, for any uh, adaptation to any change right then there is lack of employee discretion to deal with problems right and uh, of course the how the, can the employees uh, deal with the different problems uh, for if there any problem occurs or anything then uh, or um, they they have to take uh, permissions uh, they have to seek permissions from the top level because the authority ultimately lies at the top level and the decision is decision making is centralized right uh, then uh, the boundaryless organizations are the ones that seek to eliminate the chain of command. They have limitless span of control and they replace departments with empowered teams, right? So that is the concept of boundaryless organizations where the uh, organizational boundaries that are being uh, blurred, right? And uh, they, these are the organizations that uh, they do, do not believe in the narrow span of control. They have the limitless span of control, right? So as a, uh, as a result of the limitless span of control, it means that all the individuals they are being empowered, all the employees they are being empowered, Powered, right and um they are uh, they, 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 they they are transformed into these empowered teams and they are managing themselves right and they are uh, they are managing all their activities themselves right so we discuss the concept of these managing empowered teams so um, the, these organizations they basically eliminate ver vertical and horizontal internal boundaries right and um, uh, they also break down external barriers to customers and suppliers right so there are no barriers between the suppliers between the customers the customers are also part of the organization to develop the products of the organization with the help of the suppliers in the collaboration with the suppliers in collaboration with the customers these organizations they uh, build and they uh, they sell then uh, we have this uh, mechanistic model wherein which is a structure characterized by extensive departmentalization high formalization and limited information network and uh, centralization right so again here there is extensive departmentalization and there is very high formalization and there is a limited number of information network then we have this organic uh, model which is a structure that is flat it, it uses uh, cross hierarchical and cross functional teams it has low formalization uh, processes a comprehensive information network and relies on participative decision making right so that is the um, organic structure so um, 
if we see it it is basically the uh, opposed to that uh, um, um, mechanistic structure or the bureaucratic structure here in, in the uh, as opposed to the hierarchical system that chain of command system right and uh, uh, the, the narrow span of controls here in it is very much flat and uh, there is the concept of this cross hierarchical and the cross functional teams around which this structure is designed it is very less formal and it possesses a comprehensive information network and it relies on participative decision making compared to the autocratic decision making which was the hallmark of the bureaucratic systems where the cent authority is centralized and the decision making takes place the top but compared to that in here there you can see that there is a web, um, there are flat these are the flat organizations there is no vertical uh, organizational hierarchy Hara uh, and uh, the, there are cross functional teams and there is less formalization and the individuals they are allowed to participate in the decision making process right and they are more uh, they, they, they have more autonomy here so let's uh, uh, I have a graphical uh, presentation of this mechanistic and org organic model and <coughs> you see uh, under the mechanistic model uh, the uh, there is um, uh, the uh, the figure shows that the tasks they are divided into functions right so we here we can see that four different functions right and uh, uh, if we um, uh, and all these four different f uh, functions the um, each function has its own manager so uh, if we look at the extreme left on this figure so uh, the one block uh, we see that that is for example if we say that this is the uh, R&D manager and it has under it the five people right who are reporting to this R&D manager and this R&D manager is reporting to the top manager right and uh, um, uh, the second uh, the uh, the second uh, block in this figure if we see that there is again uh, we see that if we say for example that there is a, this human resource manager and he has the three people who are reporting to this human resource manager and that human resource manager is also reporting to the top manager so this is the mechanistic model where there is high specialization on the basis of what you are doing there is rigid departmentalization you can see that there are these four different departments and uh, then there is this clear chain of command uh, we know that that all the employees at the bottom they are reporting to their respective functional managers and those functional managers are reporting at the top to the CEOs then there is narrow span of control uh, so there are multiple layers of uh, managers and uh, then there are the decentralization the decision making is done at the top right and there is high formalization and so we, everyone it is he's, he's clear about who is who will be doing what the organic model as we discuss the features of organic organic model and if you look at the figure at the top uh, at the bottom uh, or left we see that it's an, an example of those uh, the, these self-managed teams and how they uh, they're in no uh, there is no supervisor there is no manager they are uh, they are uh, they are accountable uh, they are reportable to each other all the members they are self managing their teams they are setting their goals themselves and they are uh, they are accountable for their performances and they are um, they have full autonomy they are fully empowered to even make higher and fire decisions and all the decisions that 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 that, that are being taken by the supervisor the, the supervisor is eliminated and they are taken by themselves right so um, uh, we also have the example of the cross functional teams here which we are aware in the different uh, individuals from the different uh, functions the one or two individuals that come he comes from the different all the different functions and they form a cross-functional uh, team and the cross hierarchical team wherein that there are the lower and the upper uh, levels hierarchy in the management uh, the people they form and they take part at, they, they form a team right from the different hierarchies then there is free free flow of information as you can see right and there are um, and as a result of this formation of these cross-functional teams etc there is more better communication intergroup communication as well um, uh, which was one of the drawbacks of the, uh, the the functional structure that we saw earlier um, wherein there is no inter-department communication and um, one department might be doing something else and the other department might be doing something else so if the manufacturing department is uh, saying that it wants to make us it has a target that it wants to uh, uh, make a hundred uh, tables more in one month but the sales department there is no not much communication with the other departments and as a result the sales department may not have that sales target so there is lack of that but when the cross functional and the cross hierarchical teams when all the uh, members uh, or uh, they are coming from the different uh, 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 from the different departments and the f they're forming a team then there is better uh, chances of uh, communication between the different departments 
right and uh, the, and better sharing of information right so here there is the more decentralization the, of course they have their autonomy they are, they are empowered and they can make the decisions and there is low formalization as well okay um, then uh, why do the structures differ that is the question right uh, how, how why different organizations they have different structures so the one answer is that strategy because the strategy of different organizations differ therefore the structures of different organizations also differ as simple right uh, so for example the organizations who have the innovation strategy uh, which is a strategy that emphasizes the introduction of major new products and services right so you innovate right so you have this strategy that you have to bring in the innovative products into the market you have to bring in the innovative services into the market that is your strategy on the other hand another firm might be having a cost minimization strategy uh, which is a strategy that emphasizes uh, tight cost of controls avoidance of unnecessary innovation or marketing expenses and or uh, price cutting right so we have already discussed all these different strategies in detail here i'm just uh, touching them briefly in order to discuss that how these different strategies they can be related to the different structures right so the cost minimization strategy is when you are trying to con cost control your costs at all levels and you are not going into any uh, innovations or marketing expenses or into product developments etc but with your existing product you are trying to minimize your costs and in by increasing your efficiency and uh, increasing your per unit uh, decreasing your per unit costs and uh, cutting your price at all level, levels right so that is the cost minimum so produce at lowest possible costs and uh, at, uh, in the market sell them in the market right then the imitation strategy is a strategy that uh, seeks to move into uh, new products or new markets only after their viability has already been uh, proven right so the imitation strategy some firms they follow this strategy they are not the uh, first movers right but they are the imitators so what they do is that when a new product or service has come into the market these these innovators they basically uh, then uh, they have as per their strategy they bring in uh, 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 that the same product with the maybe sometimes uh, some better features uh, than the product that has come by the f uh, that the, that the new mover has brought into the market they follow the the that product they imitate that product right but when the product has once launched in the market right it is it's uh, it's we know that it's uh, the, that the information technology is cheaper and it becomes uh, cheaper every day so when it is introduced in the market its price fall, falls suddenly right so the imitating strategy the firms who follow they might be bringing in better products they might be bringing in better products into the market uh, and with lower costs uh, right then their uh, competitors or then the first movers and sometimes they uh, as per their strategy they kick out even the first movers from the market so uh, here uh, we see that uh, if we have discussed these three different strategy options right so what are the different structural options that are available to the firms based on these uh, strategies so if the firm has an innovative strategy then the organic structure might be an answer to this firm because organic structure as we discussed that it is a loose structure it has low specialization it has low formalization it is decentralized the employees they are empowered in here the f rules are not very strict and rules are not very much jotted down right and um, the employees they are uh, they are working in this uh, cross functional teams and the cross hierarchical teams when they are working in cross functional teams their communication intergroup communication can make, can be considerably improved and as a result there are different people who are coming from all the different representing all the different departments they join together they sit together they brainstorm and they can bring in more creative and innovative solutions right and and the uh, and uh, the, this type of structure also we know that it encourages the empowerment and encourages the decision making at the lower level which are really important for the innovation strategy to uh, to be implemented right unless the employees are empowered unless they are not given the flexibility they uh, cannot innovate they cannot cre uh, create new things they cannot think in new ways right so the organic structure it might be an uh, might be a good match when the organization is using the innovation strategy uh, the firms that use the cost minimization structure uh, if they use this mechanistic uh, organizational structure that would match their strategy why because we discussed that under the mechanistic uh, structure the firms uh, they use the tight controls they use extensive work specialization high formalization and high centralization uh, therefore um, they have to minimize their costs right and they take that we, we, we discussed that uh, by by, we, by by the use of the work specialization they can reap more and more economies of scale when 
the employees they don't have the discretions to do things at their own and uh, the tasks are repetitive and as a result the employees they can increase their per unit uh, product productivity and they can redu reduce the per unit costs and as a result the cost can be minimized so the mechanistic structures can be an answer to the firms who are using the cost minimization strategy while the firms who are using this imitation strategy they can uh, use a combination of the mechanistic and organic uh, structures right because um, uh, they are uh, the Im imitating firms they are partly um, using the, 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 the they are they are not creating anything new they are not innovating but they are imitating the uh, products that have been brought in the market by their competitors right therefore they need to have a combination of the characteristics of these two structures right so they uh, mix of loose with tight properties tight controls over current activities and loser controls for uh, new undertakings right so like their existing products they need to have the uh, tight controls and for the the products for which they want to uh, imitate they want to bring some changes in right by following the those of the competitors they might to might need a little organic structure uh, then we have the size um, how does the size uh, influence the structure um, the size of an organization affects its structure an organization grows larger it becomes more mechanistic right and the, um, of course when uh, 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 for very large organizations then uh, it it becomes a little difficult to give them a lot of uh, discretion the, um, to improving the employees and organizing around teams and uh, um, uh, there needs to be for with the with the with the increase in the size of the organization there are there is more specialization and there are more vertical levels and there are more rules and regulations right so this is how the size also determines the structure in the organization right so um, we discussed a number of characteristics of the bureaucratic organizations and we discussed that why we why bureaucracies uh, they survive right and we we have already discussed the characteristics of the bureau, 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 bureaucratic organizations and here in on the right side we see that the reasons why bureaucracy survives because of the large size the environmental turbulence that can be largely managed the standardization is achieved through hiring people who have undergone extensive educational training and technology maintenance control uh, so what are the uh, uh, findings uh, uh, relating to this organizational designs and employee behavior work specialization contributes to higher employee productivity but it reduces job satisfaction we can understand why because the employee morale and the uh, turns becomes down and down and their commitment and satisfaction becomes down when they have to produce something again and again there is so much repetition and there is so much monotony in the work that they're doing so the productivity increases uh, but the satisfaction falls and the benefits of special have decreased rapidly as employees seek more intrinsically rewarding jobs so the job does not remain intrinsically rewarding any right because there is no autonomy in the task and there is no sense of fulfillment in doing that job the effect of span of control on employee performance is contingent about uh, uh, upon individual differences and abilities task structures and other organizational factors and participative decision making is decentralized uh, in decentralized organizations is positively related to job satisfaction but that is not there in this bu these bureaucratic organizations on the specialized nature of work uh, the in the on the other end the organic organizations where there is more participative decision making there uh, the job satisfaction is higher right so there are a number of factors such as the that we discussed such as the strategy such as the size the technology and the environment that influence the or that determine the structural design of the organization whether it would be the mechanistic or it would be the organic organization there are a number of factors that are determining and then that is related to the performance and satisfaction we discussed that the mechanistic structures they are more related to uh, performance but not to satisfaction and the organi organic structures that are related to the job, uh, increased satisfaction and uh, increased uh, commitment of the employees right so these are of course related uh, moderated by the number of individual and differences and cultural norms right um how the individual differences and the cultural norms we have discussed it in a number of ways in our previous lectures that how the personality differences influences uh, the the ways the individuals behave under different uh, setups and how the cultural differences they can uh, influence the uh, these uh, different uh, the relationships then a structure largely dictates how uh, objectives and policies they will be uh, established 
then the structures dictate how resources will be allocated so there needs to be a good link between the uh, the strategy of the organization and the structure of the organization when a new strategy is formulated or there is change in the strategy of the organization then of course the new administrative problems emerge right and as a result the organizational performance declines right so you need to change bring changes in your organizational structure so that new organizational structure is established and the organizational performance again improved. So this is the um, Chandler's strategy uh, structure relationship which shows that how as in response to a change in structure uh, in strategy if the structure is not changed it will lead to reduced performance and how if adjustments in the structure um, uh, that are in line with the new strategy that can increase the organizational performance right. So the, uh, the, the functional uh, structure we discussed um, as we discussed earlier that it is the uh, here in the groups they are and activities they are divided by the function by, by way of functions and uh, it is a simple and in inexpensive form of structure uh, right wherein uh, where you can say that there is no duplication of tasks there are the same uh, equipments and the same resources that are being used by the uh, different departments and the specialization of business activities is there and they minimize uh, it minimizes needs of elaborate control systems there is accountability is at the top and the delegation of authority is not encouraged right so uh, consequences of this functional structure are that of course there is low employee morale when again there, uh, we discussed all these uh, things earlier that when there is the uh, emphasis on uh, specialization and the repetition and uh, on the, uh, the de departmentalization on the basis of the functions and on the basis of the jobs that are being performed there is no low discretion on the parts of the employees the roles and procedures and the chain of command is uh, very much well uh, uh, well written down and has to be followed and there is a strict control mechanisms right and uh, strict accountability right and the managed decisions are taking place at the top level and this, there is centralization right so as a result of all these factors there is low employee morale there are inadequate planning of products and markets right so there is no not much emphasis on the new product development and the uh, markets right um, but because only the repetition is being done monotony is there repetition is being done same products uh, uh, pro keep producing the same products and reaping the economies of scale the emphasis is on, is on that right and that leads to short term and narrow thinking right uh, um, of course you don't uh, th you don't have a long term vision yeah right you are just uh, uh, you have just uh, written down policies and you are just rules and regulations and you are keep on following them right and uh, you're not uh, uh, you're not thinking in terms in terms of the long term you're not thinking strategically that how the market is changing how the environment is changing how you need to respond to those factors so um, R&D may strive to over design products while manufacturing may favor low fills products that are mass produced. This is how the different departments, the conflicts can arise between the different departments. And we have the sh uh, shop which is consumer electronics which is uh, as an example uh, who is uh, based on this form of organizational structure. Then we have this divisional structure where is where there is a uh, decentralization in the um, the uh, under the divisional structure we see that there are uh, the divisions that can be on the basis of the products the, the the product divisions that can be on the basis of the consumer divisions I gave you the examples for these right and the the, the consumer electronics and the uh, uh, the corporate like the uh, the uh, credit cards they have their consumer divisions and they have their uh, they, they have their corporate divisions or the corporate clients and similarly the utilities they have their consumer division they have their corporate divisions or the industrial divisions are right wherein they're uh, they're serving their consumer products they have the different rates for the consumers and the different rates for the industry and for the corporates right so uh, these they are basically on the basis of the customers you make your divisions or you can make your divisions on the basis of the geographic regions right or you can make your divisions on the basis of the products but in all these different cases when you are you, when you're making your divisions on the basis of the any of these factors what you're doing is that you are and all these divisions are basically independent right so all these divisions they have they, they follow the, that functional structure but independently so what is happening is that uh, there are uh, there is duplication of resources right so each division has its own resources of all kinds so there is duplication of resources which is costly the structure is basically costly right and it allows local control of uh, situations of course then um, as there is more uh, uh, 
uh, authority is more de delegated to the divisions they can make their own decisions and uh, um, the uh, the competition can become dysfunctional limiting sharing of ideas between that is between the divisions because then again the divisions with they will be uh, they, they will be competing with each other on the basis of the allocation of resources right and uh, as a result uh, they might uh, the, between the divisions there might not be the sharing of ideas right so Hershey Foods is an example which is a consumer goods company and it is divided uh, it has the divisions by geographic regions such as the USA Mexico and Brazil right however division by product might be more useful such as chocolate non chocolate and grocery right because the ju ju as a result of the globalization the division by geographic region is not uh, very much um, uh, practical now the st SBU structure is wherein all, uh, basically the all the divisions when the organizations when they become very uh, very very large organizations then it is becomes difficult to handle so many divisions at the corporate level of the organization so some organizations or the conglomerates they have hundreds of divisions then it's not possible to manage it that way then the divisions they are similar divisions they are put under one uh, st strategic business unit and reduces span of control at the highest level right and make strategy implementation easier when you have uh, group them into the different SBUs right but it is of course costly Dell has reorganized uh, its uh, divisions into two strate strategic business units one is the consumer products and the other one is the commercial products right then we have the metric structure we discussed that it is uh, the most complex of all designs and it depends upon both vertical and horizontal flow of authority and communication so the under the metric structure what you're doing is that you're following the uh, basically the also the functional structure you are following as well but uh, you on the other hand there is violation of unity of command as is in the functional structure herein uh, you basically it is designed around teams uh, the cross functional teams the the, uh, the uh, uh, if i uh, show you the example in uh, one of my uh, next slides it would be clear for you uh, that uh, um, herein this is the example of the uh, simple functional organizational structure where is the where there is the top manager manager and that there are the different departments right and <clears throat> this is the example of the divisional structure where the uh, their product division a and all the different de departments under the product division a then there is a product division b and all the different departments under that and then c and all the different departments under product division c and so on then we have the metric structure wherein the, uh, the, the uh, there is the uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, an employee who is here this is the example of a university uh, of a college of business administration where there is a program wise uh, demarcation such as the undergraduate program masters phd research and executive department de uh, development and there are also the uh, academic departments right such as the accounting administrative studies finance and etc so the employee here is reportable to both the program manager uh, the right as well as to the academic departments um, uh, deans right so is responsible uh, to uh, both of them so this is basically here in what is happening is that this, uh, uh, this is a uh, more like a uh, cross-functional teams where in the uh, the projects they are carried out with the help of the pro uh, 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 with the help of the cross-functional teams right of course there is no one optimal organizational design uh, when when you see that uh, how you have to match the strategy with the structure so small firms they normally use the functional structure right and uh, the consumer firms they normally use the division structure and the large large firms they use the uh, metric structure and changes in uh, structure may not make bad strategy good bad managers uh, good managers and make bad products sell that is not necessary that uh, you so your structure is uh, does not necessarily uh, determine um, whether you will be successful or whether your strategy is good or not or whether you will be a successful manager or not um, here I have um, a number of uh, questions uh, prepared for you um, the first one is that what kind of uh, structure might someone who has a low tolerance for ambiguity feel most comfortable in the bureaucratic structure the organic structure the metric structure and the virtual structure why is it bureaucratic try to uh, come up with the arguments try to come up with the reasons that why it is bureaucratic so you need to discuss it uh, with your neighbor why a virtual organization would not make this same person feel comfortable right so give your uh, arguments why or why not second if someone has a high need for affiliation would a virtual organization be a good fit for him or not or her why or why not so again discuss it with someone whether or not an organic organization would be a good fit 
for the same person right try to think through try to uh, analyze the different elements the different characteristics of these different organizations the their their the, the structure of these different organizations their setup their characteristics and then try to come up with your answers with um, logic and um, arguments okay uh, with which type of structure uh, do you think trust is most necessary why are the substitutes for trust that are potentially built into some structures if so which ones right so try to relate these different structures to the level of trust right and how uh, uh, do you think that um, they, they, they are related to uh, the the uh, the trust level is can be different under the different structures and what is, uh, can be the consequences so try to uh, think through this as well so um, the, the, uh, these were the contents of today's lecture uh, i hope uh, you enjoyed it, it uh, to me it is a really interesting topic the stru structure of the organization the strategy of the organization and how a match between the two is important right uh, with the different forms of the organizations and the different structures that they follow uh, uh, how do we match their strategies with the different uh, structures of the organizations uh, right and um, try to be a little analytical and uh, uh, try to be a little critical as well when you try to answer all these uh, different questions and uh, try to see that uh, what are the implications of these different structural forms vis-a-vis -vis the different sectors in the uh, different sectors right and uh, how the strategy of the organization can be different different organizations can be different within the same industry and within the same industry as a result how the structures of the organizations uh, they they can be different right and uh, how uh, these strategy and the structure they uh, uh, are can be different or what are their implications for the organizations that are operating under the uh, turbulent environments vis-a-vis -vis the organizations that are operating under the stable environments right Mm, uh, so um, uh, try to think through utilizing the contents of this lecture and reading from the book uh, uh, try to analyze all these aspects and try to uh, get the answers for all these different aspects because uh, we have already done uh, I think one or two lectures on the strategic management before and this one can be partly linked to that strategic management right and uh, so try to link up all these different lectures on the strategic management and then uh, try to uh, in cohesion try to find the solution and uh, answer to these questions right so uh, with this i uh, conclude my today's lecture i wish you all the best uh, thank you for your patient hearing allah office